Recently, my niece Jordan was watching the film Lightyear. In the film, there's a scene where Buzz Lightyear flies his spaceship off a planet, around the sun, and comes back to the planet. When he gets back, even though only about four minutes had transpired for him, four years had transpired for everyone on the planet. Buzz is like, wait, how did that happen? And this scientist Kiriko goes, oh, just this thing called time dilation. Don't worry about it, it happens. That was good enough for Buzz. However, it's not good enough for my niece. Jordan was like, wait, what's going on? That doesn't make sense. How can time change? Jordan, being the curious Lono she is, decided to ask her mom to ask me if I, her physicist uncle, could make a physics video explaining time dilation for her. And I'm like, of course I can. Jordan, here's that video. I'm sorry about the wait. Things that just happen, happen. We often don't stop to question them until they stop working. Ugh! Why is this not working? Technology is frustrating. Let's pause right there and ask a counter question. The touch screen's not working, but why does the touch screen usually work in the first place? The answer to that question is going to involve something called physics. Physics is what people do to make sense of things, to figure things out. We usually don't get to the figuring things out part until stuff stops working or doesn't make sense anymore. The same type of frustration was occurring to scientists over a hundred years ago when something stopped making sense. What was this thing that didn't make sense anymore? Just this thing called light. So what's weird about light? It's just this thing where all we have to do is turn on the switch and ta-da, let there be light. We can see, we can walk around. It's weird about that. It's the things we experience all the time we forget to question and think about. Here's something to consider about light. Light travels through space and it takes time for light to travel from one location to another. If I want to get this ball from my hand to over there, it's going to take some time for the ball to leave my hand and get to its destination. However, the stuff light is made out of, these wacky wave particle things called photons, move so incredibly fast we can't see it moving with our own eyes. Just how fast is light? When I turn a flashlight on, light races out of it at a speed a little over 670 million miles per hour. How fast is that? In the 20 minutes it would take Jordan to drive the 18-ish miles from her house to her grandma's, light could go back and forth from her house and her grandma's over 6 million times. In that same 20 minutes, light could go around the Earth over 8,900 times. It could go to the moon and back 467 times. Or light could go all the way from the Earth to the sun and back about once. It took NASA's Parker Solar Probe about three months to get from the Earth, which is 93.793 million miles from the sun, to being a distance of only 15 million miles still away from the sun. Light goes really fast. It wasn't until 1677 when the first measurement of the speed of light was made by astronomer Earl Lormo. Over the next couple hundred years, increasingly accurate measurements of the speed of light were made. In the 1880s, two physicists, Albert Mikkelsen and Edward Morley, discovered something weird that made the whole science community go, hmm? That doesn't make any sense. The real thing Mikkelsen and Morley discovered was that light always travels at a constant speed. Why is that weird? To answer that, let's take a look at two goals, Parker and Peyton playing catch. When Peyton throws a ball at Parker, the ball will come towards Parker at some speed, let's say 7 meters per second. If Peyton wants to get the ball to get to Parker faster, she can run towards Parker as she throws the ball. If Peyton throws this ball while running, the speed of her running adds to the speed she throws the ball. This causes the ball to come towards Parker faster. If Peyton runs at a speed of 3 meters per second and throws the ball at a speed of 7 meters per second, the ball will come towards Parker at a speed of 10 meters per second. In general, objects add the speed they're traveling with to the speed they launch other objects away from them at. What Mikose and Molly discovered was, light doesn't follow that. If I turn my flashlight on, the light will leave my flashlight with a speed of 670 million miles per hour. If I was to start to walk, 
the speed I'm walking with does not add to the speed of light. Light is still moving with a speed of 670 million miles per hour, no matter how fast I was to run. Even if I ran as fast as the flash, I cannot make the speed of light get any bigger. The speed of light is always 670 million miles per hour. That was just weird and didn't make sense to scientists at the time. Now there was a problem that had to be solved. It took about 20 years for this problem to be cracked by one Albert Einstein. Yes, the guy with the crazy hair, however, back then, he had much shorter hair and a mustache. What Einstein realized is that the speed of light is the universal speed limit. Nothing can ever go faster than light, period. As a consequence of this, Einstein realized just two different types of speeds. The speed you move through space and the speed you travel through time. These two speeds add up to a constant value. If you increase the speed you move through space or time, the speed you move through the other must decrease. If I'm standing perfectly still, I am not traveling through space, I only travel through time. But now, if I start to walk, the speed at which I move through space has increased. As a result, my time travel speed is going to be decreasing. My clock will tick slower than your clock. It's as if I'm borrowing some of my time travel speed and shifting it into my space travel speed. Admittedly, this is a bit weird, borrowing speed. What do I mean by that? Well, a good way to picture the process of borrowing speed is by imagining a car that can't change how fast it drives, but can still turn its wheel or change directions. Imagine riding a car north. The car is only going north. There is no movement west or east. If the wheel turns slightly, the car will veer off to the side without completely turning east. The car is no longer going straight north. However, the car is not going purely eastward zero. It's going some direction in between. A mixture of north and east. The car is traveling northeast. The overall speed of travel will be the same. However, to go northeast, the car cannot travel as quickly north as when only driving in the north direction. The more eastwards the car goes, the less northwards it can go. This is just like what happens when moving through space and time. The faster something moves through space, the slower it experiences the passage of time. This is time dilation. Dilation is just a word that means something gets bigger such as your pupils in the dark. Time dilation is a word referring to the process by which moving clocks tick slower, their seconds are getting longer compared to a stationary clock. Einstein found that the time experience for a moving clock is equal to the time experience for a stationary clock divided by the square root of 1 minus the velocity of the moving clock squared over the speed of light squared. This equation is used to go from one time frame to another. That triangle looking symbol is actually a letter from the Greek alphabet called delta. The letter delta in math and physics just indicates something is changing. Here, delta t means the change in time, the amount of time that has passed. If I was moving and you wanted to know how much time transpired for me while you sat still, all you would need to do is put in the amount of time you have experienced and my speed into that equation and you can figure out how much time I have experienced. We can use this equation to investigate the effects of time dilation. For instance, if I was to go out and run at about 10 miles per hour, one of my seconds would still be about one of your seconds. The difference is so small, my computer thinks it's the same. Even if I was to move at 100 miles per hour, one of my seconds would still be one of your seconds. I would need to move really, really fast for time dilation to take into effect. For instance, if I was moving at 10 million miles per hour, about 1.5% the speed of light, one of my seconds would be 1.00011 of your seconds. Or one of my years will be one of your years and 58 minutes. So you really need to be moving for time dilation to start to be noticeable. This is why time dilation just holds our heads because we're really not equipped to 
think about this with our everyday experiences. And this is the end of our story on time dilation. Our story began in the 1880s when two physicists, Mikosa and Moly, discovered that light always travels at a constant speed. This left scientists baffled and confused until 1905 when Einstein realized the speed of light must be the universal speed limit. As a consequence of this, Einstein discovered there's really two different types of speeds, speed you move through space and the speed you travel through time. These speeds add up to a constant. That means that if one of the speeds increases, the other one must decrease. And this was the discovery of time dilation, that the faster an object moves through space, the slower the passage of time. Space and time are just interlocked. The rate you move through one increases as the other one decreases back and forth, swaying like dance partners to infinity and beyond. 